All right. So um, shall we carry on then? Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next perception now. So now we come to the perception of giving up. And this is called pahana in Pali, pahana sanya. And this is this perception. Yeah, it's when a mendicant doesn't tolerate a sensual, malicious, or cruel thought that has arisen. Yeah? And they don't tolerate any bad, unskillful qualities that have arisen. Yeah? But to give them up, get rid of them, eliminate them, and obliterate them. This is called perception of giving up. It seems to be much more than perception, right? It seems like you're doing a lot of things there. It's kind of sure if perception is not sure how that. <laughs> so I guess the perception is the starting point. Then from that starting point, you do all of these kind of things. So this is a very interesting. Idea, and this is something I usually talk, teach about on every single retreat that I teach because this relates very much to the development of the mind uh, and the development of thoughts and to the uh, also to meditation practice. Uh, yeah, because before you can really meditate, you have to abandon some of the unwholesome thoughts. Uh, so, what are first of all, what are these thoughts? Uh, sensual thought is a karma vitaka. And it means really, sensual is a very narrow term, but it means any thought related to the five sense world. So it's actually very, very broad. Almost every thought you have is Kama Vitaka in one way or another. Malicious thoughts is a Vyapada Vitaka. Vyapada means like ill will, yeah, anger, etc. So you are angry with someone. And cruel thought is the uh, Hingsaka Vitaka and uh, refers to uh, basically being harmful, yeah, being uh, inconsiderate almost, uh, being ruthless, all of these kind of things, uh, uh, not, not caring about the outcomes for other people, that's really what it comes down to, uh, not caring whether other people suffer or not, uh, this, you know, depending on what actions you do, you don't, it's not because you're angry, it's just that you don't care, this is the idea of uh, vihingsa or vihingsa kavitaka. So these are the three kinds of bad thoughts, uh, and these are also the three kinds of wrong intentions, the Noble Eightfold Path. They are directly related to wrong intention and right intention. Uh, and, and so these are critical things to get right in one's practice, and that's why I think it is mentioned in this way, uh, and here called the Pahana Sanya. So, and you will notice, so the first thing here then is to understand when these things arise in your mind, to understand what these thoughts actually are, yeah? And once they have arisen, uh, and you recognize them, uh, then you don't tolerate them. Uh, yeah? This is the thing here. In other words, you do something to abandon them. Uh, yeah? And you will notice that the language here is a very strong language uh, about abandoning. Yeah? You eliminate and you obliterate them. Uh, and it sounds like you're getting out the sledgehammer or the dynamite or something like that to blow everything up. That's what it sounds like. Yeah? It's really kind of uh, the, the, the wording is a very strong wording here. Yeah? And so from that, and this is kind of the point I make on all of these retreats when I talk about these things, uh, and uh, for those of you who haven't been here before or for those of you who have forgotten from earlier on, uh, uh, you may conclude perhaps uh, that this means you have to use a lot of willpower to get rid of this, yeah? Surely to obliterate and eliminate things, you use willpower. Uh, but that would be a mistake if you think that. Uh, and uh, the reason why it is a mistake is because... Uh, Willpower, instead of eliminating things, you just tends to hold things down. Yeah, you hold things away, you keep them away, and as soon as you let go of the hold, as soon as you let go of the grip, things tend to come back again. So willpower is not very strong. Willpower is like a, a stopgap, which doesn't actually last very long. And so when the suttas talk about obliterate and eliminate, they don't mean willpower at all. This is kind of really interesting. And this becomes very clear when you read a sutta like the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, the two kinds of thought, Majjhimanika number 19. Uh, and in there, the same wording as you find here is used, uh, but actually the way to overcome this unwholesome qualities is through wisdom, through reflecting in the right way. That is how you become, how you overcome these things. Uh, so you reflect in the right way. Yeah, then you overcome these kind of thoughts. Uh, don't just use willpower. Uh, 
And the problem is that uh, the majority of people, when it comes to, you know, you have a bad thought or whatever, we tend to use willpower, we tend to blot it out. This is the wrong time to get angry, so you kind of force it out of your mind. Yeah, I don't want to see it. And uh, so this is kind of the default action for most people to use willpower. Huh? And so it takes a lot of training not to use that default action, but actually to use things, uh, do things differently huh? and to use wisdom power instead. Huh? So what is that wisdom power? Huh? And I've already been talking about this quite a bit already, that wisdom power. Yeah, Part of the wisdom power is the development of the perceptions uh, that we have been seeing now. Part of the wisdom power is to understand that anger is the wrong way to deal with difficult people. I've been talking about how to think about difficult people, and we can't really talk about that enough because it's such a powerful habit in us uh, to get angry with others uh, when they treat us badly. It's a very powerful habit. Uh, and so we need to readjust the mind, to recondition the mind, uh, to understand that it's much more useful to think of the other person as trapped uh, in their unskillful qualities uh, and so that we can have compassion for them rather than get angry with them. Uh, this is really the right way of doing things. Uh, so wisdom power is the way. And if you use wisdom power instead of willpower, well, that is when you really do obliterate the unskillful qualities. Uh, because wisdom power, one moment the, you are angry with somebody, and then you turn your mind around, uh, and you look at them in a different way, and you have compassion instead. And it can be like that. Yeah, it can be very, very quick uh, if you get it right. Uh, and that obliterates that other quality, and then it doesn't arise again for a long time because you have actually seen something different. You have turned your mind in a different direction, and that alternative way of seeing does not allow that unskillful quality to arise. As long as you have compassion for that person, anger becomes impossible because these are what you might call mutually exclusive qualities of mind or something like that. So this is how you overcome the bad thoughts yeah you use wisdom rather than willpower and this is very kind of very very interesting yeah so the perception of abandoning then is that first of all uh, is that you have to to be able to have that perception uh, you have to understand that these things are harmful uh, and that is already quite difficult yeah to understand that uh, even ill will uh, you know sometimes you may think it is not harmful sometimes you think it is useful right okay they need to be told off uh, if someone needs to be told off, then maybe ill will is not harmful, yeah, because, you know, a bit of ill will helps you to get the energy to tell someone off. Without that, you don't have the energy to tell them off. So, so yeah, so maybe ill will is useful. And so even understanding that things are harmful is, can, is often not necessarily as obvious as you might think, yeah. Yeah, so that is the first point. The second point is that, uh, okay, even more difficult when it comes to uh, sense, uh, sensory thoughts, thoughts about the five sense world, uh, even more difficult to think of it as harmful. Uh, yeah, but now that you have done my course, yeah, you know it is harmful. Uh, is that right? Uh, maybe. <laughs> you don't, right? Uh, you, you don't know. You, you, have a, you have an initial idea of what it might be harmful. Uh, but now you need to develop those thoughts for them to really take hold uh, because it doesn't work just like that. Uh, and so they, the sensual thoughts are harmful because they buy into the permanence of, sens of sensory world. Uh, they buy into the idea that you can actually own things, uh, that you can control things, uh, that the five sense world mm -hmm. actually is worth, worthwhile pursuing. Uh, this is what it buys into. That's why you think about that world. Uh, and so understanding the downside is understanding the, uh, the problems that arise from attaching in that world uh, and uh, what happens as a consequence. Uh, but that takes, takes a lot of reflection, yeah? So you reflect on the uh, simile of the borrowed goods, yeah? The simile of the dream, uh, uh, the simile of the uh, uh, hungry dog, the dog and the bone, uh, and all of these kind of things. And as you do that, and gradually it sinks in uh, why this is problematic. Yeah? So this is the first thing, is to understand, yeah? And then once you start to understand, uh, that is when the perception of abandoning arises, because then, yeah, you really want to abandon these, these thoughts. Actually, you know they're bad. You have to really want to abandon them. If you don't want to abandon them, uh, how are you possibly going to abandon them? Uh, and that desire to abandon them arises because you know it's harmful. Uh, so you know it's harmful, then the desire to abandon comes, uh, and then you use these skillful means that we're talking about now, to overcome these things. Uh, it's a multi-pronged process, a multi-stage process. Uh, 
and each of those things have to fall into place, then you are developing the perception of abandoning here. Um, okay. Yeah, or giving up, it's called here, the perception of giving up. Same thing as abandoning here. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next perception here. So, uh, what is this next one? Ah, perception of non-desire or of uh, fading away, depending on your translation. You see here, different translation here from what you have in your paper. In the, in the pages. Is that right? You have, is it fading away? Yeah, so this is non desire. So I have changed the translation just to confuse you a little bit, uh, just to make life more, more tricky. Mm. Viraga Sanya, exactly. So uh, the, um, yeah, so I, I apologize for confusing you, but uh, the, um, the idea here is that the perception, the Viraga Sanya, which this is, is, is can, different translations. Yeah, so different possible translations. So the translation you have in your uh, pages there is fading away. The one I have is non-desire. That's why you, you're, you are perhaps now wondering what's going on here. And the reason for that is because viraga can have different meanings depending on the context. And one of the meanings is non-desire, the other one is fading away here. And uh, I think in this case, I think non-desire is probably closer to the, that's why I put it in there, closer to the mark. Yeah. That's why I put non-desire in there. But fading away is not entirely wrong either. Yeah. So either one could be right. Yeah. So um, what is the perception of non-desire or fading away? And it is as follows. Uh, yeah, viraga. Viraga means non, non-desire, non, yeah, basically. It is when a mendicant has gone to the wilderness, uh, yeah, to the foot of a tree, uh, or to an empty hut. Uh, yeah, so, and they reflect like this. So again, uh, where Chuang is, that we have, here we have the same thing again, yeah, more going to the wilderness. Uh, and uh, so in this case, it is definitely because we're dealing with a very profound perception. So the perception of non-desire, the viraga sanya, is very, is very deep. And we'll see in a second why that is the case. Uh, so, yeah, so this again should happen ideally when you are secluded, uh, when you are withdrawn from society and the mind is reasonably clear and not too cluttered with uh, all the um, uh, ordinary things of the world, uh, yeah, the uh, cuff, the whatever it is that we do in the world. Uh. And how do you reflect? Well, you reflect like this, uh, yeah, non desire perception. Uh. Going slowly to make it more exciting. Yeah. So this is the this is the perception. Yeah. This is peaceful. This is sublime. That is the stilling of all activities, uh, the letting go of all attachments, uh, the ending of craving, uh, non-desire. Er, what happened here? No, something has disappeared. Non-desire. Perception of non-desire. Mm, something is missing here. All right, let's see if I can. This is going to go. Uh, yeah, so this is what should be in there. Ah, let's kind of let's let's copy and paste here. If I can see what I'm doing. Is that missing in your paper as well, or is it just mine now? Just mine. Okay, good. I'm glad you are you are more skillful than me here. So. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So this is the uh, perception of non-desire. So, what do you think? What do you reckon? Uh, does it sound good or bad? Uh? So the um, the first thing here, of course, which I kind of sets the tone for this, uh, is at the very beginning. This is peaceful. This is sublime. Yeah. Etang santang, etang panitang is the Pali. Santa is uh, peaceful, uh, and it is a uh, it is. Um, Spelled exactly the way as Santa Claus, exactly the same spelling. Uh, Santa. Santa Claus is not not peace, not necessarily peaceful, but uh, this is uh, what it is here. So this is peaceful, Santa, and it's one of those beautiful words in the Pali language that you find. Uh, yeah, the 
one of the epithets of the Buddha, the words of the Buddha, is the Santo Muni. Yeah, Santo Muni is like a sage, uh, one of the ancient Pali words for sages. Uh, and Santo is peaceful. So the Buddha is the peaceful sage. It's nice, isn't it? Uh, we have a, uh, an, an Agarika at our monastery in Perth. He changed his name. He used to be called Amandus. And now he's called Santo Muni. <laughs> yeah. Some of you know Amandus? Yeah, I actually know Amandus. Yeah, yeah. Amandus is one. He, he makes coffee for everyone. He's kind of really, he's, uh, he's, this is Amandus. He's, he's old. He's German originally, but he lived in Australia for donkey's years. And so now he's probably more Australian. And he, uh, has, he has been a, he has part of the furniture in the monastery. He's been around for over 40 years and always an anagaric, and never moved beyond becoming an anagarika. So he's still an anagarika after 40 years. And uh, it's nice to have people like that, yeah? And they just look after people, and he's kind of getting old now. So uh, when you get old, you, I guess that's what happens when you get old. You become, more, you become more caring, maybe, when you become old, yeah? More kind of uh, just looking after people. There's something about old age which is, uh, is nice in a way, yeah? You become more, you become less... Uh, I guess, less concerned about the future and about having a career and about kind of doing things in the world. You become more relaxed and you become just more caring about people. So, he, so I, I think he deserves the, the name Santo Muni because of that. Uh, so that's, that's all right. Uh, so this, anyway, is the word here for peaceful. Yeah, this is peaceful. And so when we talk about peace in Buddhism, we don't just mean a little bit of peace. Yeah, we mean like full peace. Uh, Santo, the Buddha says this is peaceful. He means this is really, really peaceful. That's what it means. Uh, this is sublime. This is pan, etang panitang. Yeah. And again, when the Buddha says this is sublime, uh, he means the top of sublimity. Is that the right word? Sublimity? Anyway, whatever. Uh, sublimeness. I'm not sure which one is correct. But um, yeah, so this is the, like the peak of these kind of things. Uh, when the Buddha says you are happy, it doesn't mean you're a little bit happy. It means like you are the peak of happiness. And that's kind of, the Buddha is understated. I've made this, uh, made this uh, a point many times before. Uh, yeah. So this is peaceful. This is sublime. It means that now we are at the pinnacle of peacefulness and sublimeness. Uh, what is that pinnacle? That pin pinnacle is the stilling of all activities, uh, the letting go of all attachments, uh, the ending of craving, non-desire, extinguishment. Uh, what is this? What does this mean? And um, the stilling of all activities is sabbe, sankara, samatha. Sankara, again, we are talking about sankaras the other day. And sankaras is a, a means here, the will, yeah? the stilling of the will in a particular way. Yeah? So when you still the will, yeah? one way of thinking about this is like deep samadhi, you still the will. And another way to think about this is when you become an arahant and you don't create kamma anymore. That's another kind of stilling of the will, stilling of the active will that creates kamma for the future. Yeah. So this is kind of the stilling of all activities. Uh, yeah, the letting go of all attachments. Sab upadi patinisagga. Upadi, sab upadi. Pat so upadi is again like this idea of all ownership. Uh, you don't own anything anymore in the world. Uh, in other words, same thing as attachment. Yeah, no attachments, no ownership. You let go of everything. And when we talk about ownership, what does that mean? It means anything that you think you own. Yeah, like the material things you own, family members that you think maybe you own, or people that you own. You think anyway, uh, and also ownership in terms of yourself. Yeah, your body, your mind. This is also ownership. This is my mind. Stay away. I. Leave it alone. Don't read my mind or whatever that uh, people say sometimes. Uh, yeah, like the lady in the back. Right there. We are. Why, why are we attuned sometimes yeah, to things? Uh, so uh, this is kind of, all of these things are very interesting because when you talk about, for most people, the stilling of all activities, uh, the stilling of the will, it doesn't sound like happiness. Uh, and the only way you can start to understand this is when you go into meditation practice and you become peaceful again. Yeah, talked about this many times before. It, that is when you start to understand why the stilling of the will is so powerful, because you see it for yourself. But for most people, the idea of giving up all your will means giving up creativity. It means giving up the ability to do things in the world. It sounds terrible for most people. 
And as always, the Buddha sees things in the exact opposite way to most people. Huh? Letting go of all ownership. You own nothing. Wow, that's terrible. Huh? Yeah, owning nothing is like, that's really awful, right? Uh, the more you own, the better. Actually, the Buddha says, the more you own, the worse. Uh, that's what the Buddha says. Uh, so again, going in the opposite direction of the world. Uh, let go of everything. Uh, the ending of craving. Uh, wow, that sounds really boring, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> Imagine having no desires, right? Wow, what are you going to do? You're just going to sit there all day? It kind of sounds really incredibly boring, uh, no craving at all. Uh, and to most people, it is boring because they, you know, craving is what drives them. Craving is what makes life interesting, uh, pursuing your dreams and all these kind of things. Uh, but again, it's because they have never seen the alternative. Uh, they have never did not know what it means to have a deep state of meditation and just blissing out. They have no idea what that means. Uh, that is really what ending or craving means. It doesn't mean the bland, boring, gray nothingness. That is not what it means at all. It means something that is actually really, really delightful and really, really happy. That is why it is so beautiful. Viraga, uh, non-desire, the fading away or non-desire. Uh, extinguishment, uh, Nibbana is the last one. Uh, extinguishment. Yay, extinguishment. <laughs> Extinction. Hooray, extinction. <laughs> this, is why, <laughs> this is why the Buddha is sometimes misunderstood, yeah? and uh, why he was misunderstood also the time of the uh, ancient times, two and a half thousand years ago, because people said, oh, you are just an annihilationist. Uh, you believe in the extermination of an existing being. That's what they said about the Buddha. But not really. The Buddha is about extinguishing, yeah? and the primary thing that you extinguish is Dukkha, yeah? So that's kind of the primary thing. So suffering goes. Uh, and of course, that's a good, nice, good deal, yeah? Suffering goes. Uh, the other thing that gets extinguished is the defilements of the mind. The uh, loba dosa moha gets extinguished. Uh, so having no defilements, what does that mean? It means you have a beautiful mind, very clear, full of all the opposite qualities. In other words, full of generosity, full of loving kindness or compassion, and full of wisdom, uh, What's not to like? Yeah, extinguishment is good. That's what it leads to. And this is how you can see in the world whether someone has gone a long way on the path. Because if you really have extinguished these qualities, you will have those opposite qualities. Yeah, and so you can tell what is this person like? Are they generous or are they stingy? Are they full of anger or do they have some metta and loving kindness? So you look at someone, and then when someone has good qualities like the Buddha then you can place a degree of confidence in that person. Uh, but if they are full of defilements, then, and then they say, oh, it's not defilements, it's crazy wisdom. Uh, don't believe it. Uh, yeah, Because that goes against this very idea uh, that we see in the suttas. Uh, yeah, what, yeah, anyway, that's, that's a kind of crazy saying by, I think, Rajneesh. Yeah, Rajneesh, one of these kind of crazy sages uh, from India. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, said that, uh, what, what did he say again? The saying was something like, uh, I am, I'm so detached, uh, I'm not even attached to detachment. <laughs> <laughs> hence, hence, hence these 20, 41 Rolls Royces or whatever. Yeah, that's why. Because uh, I can have all these, these Rolls Royces. He was famous for having the largest fleet of Rolls Royces uh, in the world or something like that. I, I can't remember how many, 25 or 45 or something like that, Rolls Royces. And that was his answer when he was asked, you know, why do you have so many Rolls Royces? You're supposed to be a sage. Well, it was because I'm so detached. I'm not even attached to detachment. That was his answer. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds good until you realize it's complete nonsense. But that's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, have a quick look at the next one as well, because the next one is uh, closely related to this one. Uh, so the next one is uh, called the perception of cessation. Uh, so what is that? It is when a mendicant has gone to the wilderness, to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut, and reflects like this. Uh, this is peaceful. Uh, this is sublime, that is the stilling of all activities, uh, the letting go of all attachments, the ending of craving, cessation, extinguishment. Uh, this is called the perception of cessation. Uh, 
So uh, very similar to the previous one, uh, yeah. So again, cessation in these cases normally refers to the cessation of craving. So non-desire, basically the same thing as what we saw before. Uh, and so when these things cease, then that is the highest kind of happiness. All of those defilements of the mind, all the problems in the world are gone. Uh, and when all of those defilements are gone, then you have access to meditation at any time. Uh, so if you think of the best meditation you ever had, uh, yeah, and then you multiply that by a million, and you can have that whenever you want, uh, that's kind of the idea here. Yeah. So if you, if you think you know bliss, then uh, you haven't seen nothing yet, as they say. Yeah. And this is kind of the path of, uh, of meditation, according to the Buddha. All right, let's, let's do some more meditation together. Okay, maybe we should just carry on and last chance. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, here, the non desire, the fading away, the Pali word is that viraga? Viraga, yeah. How is that different from pahana? Uh, how is it different from pah pahana? Is more like uh, the active abandoning of something, giving up. Uh, the uh, fading away is the natural consequence of meditation. Uh, yeah, so one is where you actively... So one's passive. One is more passive. It just happens as a matter of course during meditation. The other one is an active active approach to your to your mind or to your defilements. So viraga is more like letting it go and pahana is more like yeah. giving it up. You can, you, can put, you can put it that way, yes. Yeah. A little yeah. bit more active. Yeah, more active. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You actually use your wisdom. The other one, you just let things be and you allow them to disappear as a consequence. Yeah. yeah. Over, when it's like overcoming exactly yeah active yeah active active yeah. Ajahn, good morning yesterday Ajahn you mentioned um this practice for the ugliness, drawbacks, and on on all the the, the bodies. This is for monastic a uh, monastic practice and not lay people, is it? You mean, you mean the, uh, the the uh, ugliness of the body, the third yeah, one past yeah. the body, that one? Uh, yeah. I I I mean, generally speaking, I would say it is for someone who lives a celibate lifestyle. Uh, yeah whether it's monastic or a lay person. Uh, uh, that's what I would say. So it can be, uh, it can be lay people, but depending on how you live your lay life. Some, some people, some lay people live almost like monastics. Yeah, I mean, I know, know lay people who live very secluded and they just meditate and they just live a, uh, that kind of life. So I would say it depends on the person, a bit on the person. Uh, yeah. Why is it? Why? Uh, because uh, the purpose is to abandon uh, sexuality, basically. Uh, yeah, that's the reason. Uh, and so if you live an ordinary kind of lay life, then uh, it's, you know, it's, it go, goes counter to how you ordinarily live. So we kind of get a clash of two, of two things. Uh, that's why. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, yeah. yeah. We'll see that in a second because there's a sutta which explicitly makes that connection in a second. Uh, so, yeah. In the Vitaka Santana Sutra, uh, the third method, uh, I'm not sure what is the Pali word because I didn't check that. The third method uh, of giving up bad thoughts, is that, uh, how is that compared to Viraga and Pahana? Okay, so the third method is Asati Amanasikara, non attention, non mindfulness. That's the third method of the Vitaka Santana Sutra, uh, Majjhimanaka 20. Uh, Vitaka Santana means the calming of thought. So it is the overcoming, especially of unwholesome thoughts. Uh, so asati means uh, not mindfulness, yeah, and manasikara means attention, non-attention. So it means you don't pay attention to the thoughts when they arise in your mind. Uh, yeah, so you are meditating. This is during meditation usually. This is talking about the adhicitta, that sutta. Adhicitta means the higher mind. Uh, that is the jhanas and these kind of things. Uh, so it is about the process of meditation, really. 
So what do you do during the process of meditation? Yeah, let's say you, you're meditating peacefully and suddenly some dodgy thought arises in your mind that you don't really want to be there. You get upset about something or whatever during your meditation. Yeah, This happens to everyone every now and again. Yeah? And uh, then you just don't pay attention to that thought. So you just stay with the breath or whatever and you allow the thought to be in the background. You don't really pay attention to it. You don't have sati. You stay with the breath instead and then gradually that thought will disappear as a consequence of that. Uh, yeah. That would be closer to samvara, that means. Samvara, yeah, to restraint. Uh, yeah, is, you can argue it as a kind of restraint. Yeah, I would say, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but Sunday. I would also say it is also, it is also a kind of abandoning as well because you are abandoning by not paying attention. Yeah, so it is a kind of fahana at the same time, I would argue. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah, I'm glad you know your suttas. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, that's, that's nice. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. On the question of uh, generosity, there's one sutta, Dana Sutta, that says the last part uh, um, uh, when you give, you give an ornament for the mind. It's something that I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Would you be able to? What that means, yeah. You give as an, okay, this is a, Okay, we're, sure, we can take questions on anything, it doesn't matter, that's fine. So we give as an ornament, uh, chit alankara is the Pali word. Um, chitta parikara, chit alankara. Parikara means like a requisite of the mind. Yeah? Parikara is requisite. So for example, monastics, we have requisites. This robe is a requisite for a monastic. Yeah? So requisite is something you use for a certain outcome. Yeah? So you use this to lead the monastic life. And so uh, uh, generosity is a requisite uh, on the spiritual path. Yeah? It is something that you use to en uh, enhance the spiritual practice and the spiritual path. Uh, that is kind of the idea. So it's chitta parikara, and a requisite of the mind. Chit alankara. Alankara is an ornament uh, or jewelry. Yeah? It's a, uh, and it's a, it, it makes the mind beautiful. Yeah? It's just like you use an ornament to make the body look more beautiful, yeah? you use uh, this to make the mind beautiful. And the beautiful mind means a mind that is pure, a mind that is blissful, uh, a mind that is uh, tranquil, uh, where mindfulness is strong, where the energy is strong. Yeah? These are all the kind of the things that make the mind very bright and brilliant. Uh, one of the words for um, a, a, this kind of mind in the suddhas is pabhasara, pabhasara chitta. Pabhasara means like a radiant mind, yeah? Same kind of thing, yeah. And the reason why you want to have a radiant mind is because a radiant mind is the opposite of a defiled mind. So a mind that has this kind of ornament is basically a mind that doesn't have any defilements. And that mind is a mind which is useful for deep meditation and also useful for insight later on and for wisdom and all these kind of things. So that's why you have this idea of an ornament for the mind, yeah? It's something that makes the mind beautiful in this way, yeah. Please, yeah. Um, I read that you you had uh, translated the Vinaya Pitaka mm. at Sutta Central, right? Mm. So um, I suppose one of the benefits would be for the young monks, those who are not proficient in Pali yet, actually refer to Vinaya Pitaka in, uh, that have been translated. And the other benefit for the lay yeah. people, how can we make use of Vinaya Pitaka ah, okay. with respect to... Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, that's a nice question. Thank you for that question. Yeah. I always like to, it's always nice to talk about one's own work, you know. So, <laughs> so um, how do you use use of it? It's uh, The thing is, um, it, it's very different kind of work from the suttas. Uh, the suttas are often very inspiring and uplifting. Uh, and you read about monastics and, and also lay people, for that matter, who practice really well, who have all these kind of amazing qualities, uh, yeah? And that's very uplifting and very inspiring. And you think, yeah, I will practice in the same way. The Vina Pitika is the opposite. <laughs> Vina Pitika is all the bad things that monastics do. Yeah? Yeah. 
Because the Vinaya Pitaka is about the rules and regulations, and behind every rule there is a story about what someone did so that that rule was laid down. And of course, they would do bad things for these rules to be laid down. So the Vinaya Pitaka is like the anti-inspiration. So if you, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, what is nice about it is that if you just read the suttas, uh, you might have this feeling that in ancient India everyone was just a saint, everyone was just great, and today we are hopeless, we have no chance, yeah, because everyone was so wonderful in those days. Uh, and sometimes that is the sort of uh, thing you will hear in Buddhist circles, yeah, in those people who arose at that time in ancient India, they had good karma, they were special, otherwise they wouldn't be able to rise with the Buddha. But I think that is an oversimplification of things, to say the least. Uh, the Buddha never says that all you guys, you all have good karma, that's why you're here with me. He never says that. This is just an assumption by some modern readers. Uh, and I don't think it's always true. Huh? And especially when you read the Vinaya Pitaka, you get very quickly disabused of that idea. Huh? The Vinaya Pitaka is very clear that actually people in those days are very much like now. They're full of defilements, full of all kinds of things. They get angry, they murder, they kill, they have, just do all kinds of terrible stuff. And you'll be surprised. Sometimes you read the Vinaya, you think they're worse than people today because of all the things they got up to. Huh? And that is the nice thing about it. It gives you a sense of hope, that there's hope for me as well. Yeah, there's a chance for everyone. Huh? And people haven't really changed. People are the same two and a half thousand years ago as they are today. That is one of the things that comes out of reading the Vinaya Pitaka, which can be, can be nice and useful. Um, what else comes out of it? The Vinaya Pitaka has a lot of uh, stories about the Buddha and how the Buddha uh, dealt with things in an ordinary way. You get the feeling for the Buddha as a person, not for the Buddha as an arahant, you can kind of distinguish the Buddha as an arahant on the one hand, in other words, all the qualities that made him special, uh, and then the Buddha as a person, which is more his uh, human side and how he kind of interacts with people. Uh, and that human side of the Buddha comes out much more in the Vinaya Pitaka because you see him, how he deals with people, how he treats people uh, in daily life. Yeah, And uh, there are many little stories in there that are really kind of nice and very inspiring in a human kind of way, you know, and um, I, sh I should kind of make a list of little stories one day so I kind of remember them more clearly. But uh, one of them is a tiny little, little anecdote where the, the Buddha sometimes he would walk uh, among the dwellings of the monks, yeah, and walk around and kind of look at the monks and see what they're up to, right? Uh, and Ajahn Brahm used to do that as well. He would kind of, Ajahn Brahm would walk around the monastery. Ajahn Brahm would never go, go to the kutis, but this is the Buddha would kind of go all the way around the monastery. Yeah? They would see what the monks are up to, and sometimes he would tell the monks off, yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, you can't do this. Other times he would be more encouraging. Yeah? So there's one occasion where there was a monk who was sewing his robe. In those days he would sew by hand, so he was sewing his robe. And the Buddha asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm patching my robe. And he said, oh yeah, well done, good. Yeah, that's great, that's the way it should, you know, this is the right approach, patching your robe in that way. Yeah. That's like a very simple little thing. Yeah? And you think, what's that got to do with the Buddha? Well, it shows you the Buddha as a human being. Yeah? yeah, he acts, he interacts with people, just like we interact with people. Just like Ajahn Brahm might say to me, oh, yeah, well done for having a, a patch on your robe. Yeah, and the same, same kind of thing, because that is the small little details of monastic life, that you're supposed to look after your robes and you're supposed to patch them and these kind of things. Yeah? That is one of those examples, and maybe, I don't know how much it means to you, but I find, personally, I find these things very nice and interesting. Yeah. Another example, which is kind of much more powerful, is, uh, and many of these, you will have heard this story before, but it's a very, very nice story. And again, the Buddha is walking around the monastery, yeah, and he comes to this monk who is sick, really sick, really ill. He has dysentery. Dysentery is kind of an illness where everything kind of comes out of your body without control. And so he's really filthy. And then he asked this monk, well, how come no one is looking after you when you are so sick? Yeah. And then this monk says that, well, the reason is because I don't do anything for the other monks. Uh, and so they don't look after me. Yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, then uh, the uh, Buddha says to Ananda, Ananda, his, his Buddha's attendant, they always kind of go around together. He says to Ananda, well, let's get some water and clean this monk up. Yeah. So the Buddha and Ananda look after this sick monk, they clean him up, they wash him down, all those kind of things, they dry him up, put on fresh robes, and then the Buddha grabs the monk by the head, the monk grabs by the head, and they lift him up on the bed. Yeah, this is the Buddha. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? 
You don't really normally think about the Buddha in that way. Normally the Buddha is like this. He's sitting on a seat teaching the Dhamma. That's usually the Buddha, right? Uh, this is kind of, and maybe that's the disadvantage of having Buddha statues. We think the Buddha is always like this. That's kind of maybe the downside of the Buddha statues. Uh, but the Buddha is not. The Buddha interacts with people in a very, very human way. Uh, and he has compassion for people. He has kindness. Uh, and so he leads by example in this ex very human kind of interaction with people around him. It's beautiful. And then after uh, cleaning up this monk and putting him on the bed or whatever, then he goes to the monks. Uh, and he says to the monks, well, why aren't you look after the sick? This monk is, you know, really ill. What are you, what's going on? Uh, and then the monks say, well, he doesn't do anything for us, so we don't do anything for him. <laughs> and of course, the Buddha is not impressed, right? It's kind of, you know, that's kind of a very bad way of thinking about things. Uh, it's not monastic life. It's not a business deal. You do something, I do something in return. That's not really how it's supposed to work. Yeah. And so then the Buddha says, well, you know, he says that, well, you have no mother and fathers. Uh, yeah, when you have gone forth, you don't have that connection with your parents anymore. You have no one to look after you. If you don't look after each other, who is going to look after you? Huh? And then the Buddha says, whoever would look after me, yeah, whoever would look after the Buddha should also look after each other, all the other monks. Uh, yeah, if you're going to look after the Buddha, you should actually look after everyone in the Sangha, all the monastics. Uh, and it's a very kind of, this is one of the most, to me, one of the most human stories of the Buddha that you find but either in the Vinaya or the Suttas. Uh, and these are the sort of things you find in the Vinaya, don't find anywhere else. Uh. So this is kind of the, um, some of the things, and there's quite a few stories like that, all kinds of stories, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, the other thing that you find in the Vinaya, oh, um, how much time? <laughs> The other nice thing you find in the Vinaya is you find a lot of the background stories for people. Like you find the, the story of Anathapindika. You know Anathapindika? Yeah? Anathapindika, a very famous donor to the Buddha. You find the story of him, how he met the Buddha, and how he built the monasteries for the Buddha. You find the story of Visaka, Lady Visaka, the Buddha's maybe chief lady, female lay disciple. You find the story of Jivaka, Jivaka Kumarabacha, who was the Buddha's physician. And the background is a really interesting story of him and how he became a doctor and all of these kind of things. Uh, and there's a story of a large number of people like that who you otherwise wouldn't know. There's a story of Anuruddha and Mahanama, which is a really nice little story, which I like to tell sometimes. Uh, and all of these stories are, are in there. You don't really find them anywhere else except for the suttas, uh, the Vinaya Pitika. And then uh, you have a few Jataka stories in there about past lives uh, or, uh, and things like that. Uh, um, and then you have some really weird stories. And one of the stories that I usually tell on retreats, uh, I don't haven't told it here yet, and I may never tell it, but maybe I'll tell it now instead uh, anyway, because you asked about the Vinaya Pitika, yeah, so might as well tell it now. And uh, this is this, actually I usually tell that in connection with the Ragro monk, yeah, and at this time I didn't do that. Uh, we, you were here for when we talked about the Ragnarok monk. You weren't here. You missed out on the Ragnarok monk, the one about overcoming ill will. You kind of look on the good qualities, not the bad ones. Yeah, okay. So that, that story is about the Ragnarok monk. And of course, Ragnarok monks, they're always on the outlook for rags. Yeah, because if you have a rag robe, you need rags to fix up your robe and all these kind of things and to maybe make a new one or whatever. And so very often you find the rags maybe on the roadside or you find the rags somewhere else. But one of the places they would find the rags were in the cemeteries, uh, the charnel grounds, yeah? That is where you burn the corpses, yeah? And people would then throw away the corpse after the person is dead, chuck it onto the charnel ground or the cemetery. Uh, but when they do that, they would have a cloth around the body for modesty purposes or whatever. So you kind of have the dead body in a cloth, right? Uh, it kind of makes sense. Uh, and of course, for the monk, that was great. Yeah, free cloth. Yeah, the bodies on the shallow ground, you just kind of take the cloth off the body, and then you can make a robe out of that. Yeah. But the thing is that if you're going to take the cloth from a dead body, you don't want to wait too long. Yeah, because if you wait too long, it gets really disgusting. Yeah, because the body starts to rot and all this kind of thing. So you want a fresh corpse, ideally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no wonder Buddhists get a bad reputation sometimes. Every time we are strained. Anyway, so this is this, this is um, this is the way it is. Yeah, the thing is that monastics are very practical people. Yeah, we don't kind of often don't worry too much about the kind of finer refinements of these things. Yeah. And so, 
So he would go, this monk would go to the charnel ground and he sees a very fresh corpse, maybe a little bit too fresh as much as it may actually be. So he goes to the corpse and he starts to unroll the cloth from the corpse, yeah, because it's kind of wrapped around the corpse. And as he unrolls the cloth from the corpse, the corpse starts to speak. <laughs> and the corpse says, don't take my cloth. <laughs> And the monk says, shut up, you're dead. You know? <laughs> dead people don't have a say. Yeah? So, <laughs> so he ca carries on taking the cloth. Yeah? And then when he's taken the whole cloth up, yeah, and he kind of starts walking off, yeah, doesn't worry about the dead corpse, and the corpse gets up. Yeah? And the corpse starts following after him. Yeah? So it's like a zombie. It's a dead person, right? So this is kind of the first zombie history in the, in the kind of... Uh, <laughs> In world literature, right? So they're coming, coming after it, the zombie, yeah. And uh, it's kind of fascinating because you start to understand how humanity, we are almost always the same. There's nothing new in the world, right? It's just more of the same. It, all of these things go back, I think, to as far as back in time as you want to go. Nothing is really new, right? And so then the monk realizes actually the zombie coming after me. So he starts running, right? And he runs off. And he runs all the way to his cutie slams his door in the cutie and the zombie car just, just doesn't make it and then the zombie falls down outside yeah the, the zombie has exhausted all his energy and that's kind of it uh, and so that's the that's the uh, the zombie story yeah and it's kind of so if you think the vinaya is boring sometimes the vinaya is very interesting yeah? and then the kind of the nice thing after that is that then the the monk the monk the, the monks that go to work says oh yeah you know this happened to this monk yeah he took the cloth and the zombie came after and all of these kind of things yeah so that's well, what should we do about this and then the buddha lays down the rule and the rule is you should not take the cloth from the corpse if it's still too fresh you should wait till the corpse is cold yeah then we can take the cloth <laughs> that's why the monks have so many rules yeah because we have rules about everything about not taking cloth from corpse that are too fresh that's one of the rules that we have there. That rule is still there. <laughs> so this is why the... Uh, so, you, so you wonder, is that possible? Did it actually happen? Or, or what, what is the story? Uh, yeah? And uh, the answer is, I don't know. I don't know what the real story is. It could just be that it was insensitive to take the cloth too soon. Yeah? Maybe the family members complained or something, and maybe the story kind of got expanded. Or maybe something like that did happen. Yeah? I mean, why do we have stories about zombies in the first place? Maybe the consciousness was still attached to the body. And if the consciousness was still there, maybe it could get up. Yeah? There are many stories. There are stories in the present day about people who go into coffins. And they're not actually dead. Yeah? They're going to get buried in a coffin. That's, you know, in the old days... I don't know if you had that here in Malaysia, but they had that in the Western world. They had like... Uh, a little bell on the coffin. Huh? You know that? Huh? And the bell had a little string that went through the coffin so that if the corpse wasn't dead, you could ring the bell uh, yeah, inside. Uh, yeah? And this is a simple, sim it's true actually, this is true because sometimes they weren't dead. Yeah, and they kind of they got it wrong. They thought it was dead. Uh. So this is kind of so, so zombie stories are not entirely unreasonable. Yeah, they, they may, it may be possible something like that happened. Uh. So is that enough? About the vineyard for now, or do you, yeah? Okay, yeah. We come, come back to more stories later on. <laughs> okay. One more question. Well, this is going to be a request. Request, okay. Yeah, until yeah. you mentioned, yeah. I actually had zero impression of what is in the Vinaya. Yeah. But now that you mentioned Vinaya, has all this interesting yeah. story, yeah. inspiring. It actually, it reminded me of, of the Dhammapada, where there were mm. many inspiring mm. stories. Mm. And in fact, Bande Sarada did a great job producing that book uh, based yeah. in Singapore. Yeah. yeah. So may I suggest perhaps in one of your future <laughs> retreats, yeah. bring out stories and, and teachings from Vinaya that is applicable and useful and practical for lay people. Okay. That would be like very more, helpful because like, like, it is something different from what yeah. every other monk is doing. Yeah. Everybody else is talking about the, the yeah. uh, uh, Dikayas. Yeah. So now, bring, yeah. since you translated the uh, the Vinayas, yeah. Yeah. why not you, yeah. you take take the lead in bringing out Vinaya <laughs> stories that can be helpful and yeah. practical yeah. For, yeah. for lay people like ourselves? Okay, let me consider it. Let, I, I will consider it. Thank so, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, 
out of compassion. Out of compassion. <laughs> and wisdom, that's right, yeah. Yeah, the Dhammapada commentary is very, has a lot of really nice stories. Dhammapada and also the Jataka tales, uh, a lot of them are really nice. Uh, and uh, so I, I agree with that. Uh, and, uh, but I don't usually do those. <laughs> but anyway, so you're right.